For those who dive in the vicinity of coral reefs, the experience is said to be awe-inspiring, even mystical. The beauty of the reef is unparalleled in the marine environment, and perhaps anywhere on planet Earth. Sometimes referred to as the rainforest of the sea, these magnificent structures are home to a diverse array of producers, consumers, and scavengers. Collectively, these comprise a dynamic ecosystem that is, in every sense of the word, a community. Well, you see, birth, life, death, um, just like in any community, uh, organisms living together, interacting, there's um, predation, there's competition, there's disease, there's physical uh, disturbance, there's storms that come along and uh, kill off a reef and set it back in such a way where it has to begin growing all over again. Uh, it's a very dynamic place. Most people think a reef is like a Garden of Eden. It's a very stable, uh, benign place where everything stays the same. That's completely wrong. The coral reefs are constantly changing. Many coral reefs actually are not dominated by coral as much as they're dominated by coralline algae. Now, coral is an animal. Uh, it grows in the form of a polyp that secretes a solid coating uh, composed of calcium carbonate that it uh, gets out of uh, the dissolved components, chemical components of seawater. Coral likes to grow as a community member, and so it will grow sort of an apartment building or a community structure composed of hundreds of coral polyps, each secreting their own exoskeleton. Coralline algae, however, is uh, a, it's, a, it's a plant. Uh, it is photosynthetic. And there are two types of, of algae that are important in coral reefs or in, in reefs. Uh, both of these types of algae secrete the same sort of calcium carbonate hard mineralogic material that the coral will secrete. There is coralline algae, which is uh, the plant that looks similar in growth form and in color to many types of coral. And there's calcareous algae, which is something that looks much more like a plant. It has leaves and a stalk, and it's green, it's photosynthetic. But when it dies, it uh, calcifies. It turns into a white, hard mineral material of calcium carbonate. The relationship between some of the algae and animals that live in coral reefs is symbiotic meaning the two species live together. The plant cells get protection from their potential herbivores by being inside the animal. And the animal benefits because the plants um, photosynthesize and construct more short-chain sugar compounds than they need themselves. And the animal actively digests those short-chain sugars. So the plants are feeding the animal. Two other coral reef residents, anemones and anemone fish, also provide something of value to one another. The anemone helps defend the fish through its stinging tentacles, nematocysts. The fish lives right in amongst those tentacles and receives refuge from predators. The fish itself also helps defend the anemone, darting out and attacking intruders, and also may provide the anemone with food. The mutually beneficial, symbiotic relationship between members of coral reef or other communities is known appropriately enough as mutualism. But symbiosis can take other forms as well. Perhaps the least complex of these is commensalism, in which two species live together but have little or no impact on one another. And then there's parasitism, also a kind of symbiosis, but with a decidedly one-sided outcome. This is a case where one species is living off a host, gaining nutrition from a host. Usually it is harmful to the host, so it's a plus minus relationship. Typically parasites will not kill their hosts. It's not beneficial to do that, but they may harm their host. Uh, there are parasites on crabs that will inhibit reproductive activity. There are parasites on plants that sometimes will cover the photosynthetic surfaces and inhibit photosynthesis. If it's an obligate parasite, that is, in other words, the parasite doesn't exist unless it is in the host, uh, it doesn't do the parasite any good to 
have such a deleterious effect on the host that the host dies or is preyed upon by something else because that kills the parasite at the same time. So that's why you need this uh, sort of adjustment between a parasite. How much damage can, you, can the parasite do and still maintain itself and maintain the host? The relationship between a host and its parasites is very fine-tuned. If the parasite becomes too numerous and becomes too harmful to the host, the host populations will decline and the parasites will face a shortage of hosts and then themselves go into decline. While symbiotic relationships are important in many marine communities, they play an especially critical role in coral reefs. But symbiosis within a reef community can be threatened by any number of factors, including severe storms and a process known as bleaching. People are seriously worried about the impacts of global warming on coral reefs. The corals are not really just animals, they also have symbiotic algae in them that live in their tissues. Um, and are very actively involved in their metabolism, so it really is a mutualistic relationship. When corals bleach, they expel those algae, and they are at a severe disadvantage then in gaining nutrients. And so if that bleaching occurs over a long enough period, the coral-animal part of the relationship dies. And there's good evidence now that uh, that is to some extent related to temperature. Coral reefs are also exposed to a number of other threats including nutrients used in farming and agriculture. And as you add nutrients, commonly what happens is that the nutrients stimulate the growth of seaweeds, which grow over the coral and kill it. And they're now in a sort of an increasing recognition that some places in the tropics, the coral reefs are being degraded by nutrient discharges from the land, either sewers or runoff from agricultural fields. So um, those, all those things sort of combined um, actually sort of um, paint a fairly bleak picture for the future of coral reefs.